Turning now to a problem that the United States and communities around the world have long struggled with, and that is homelessness. But according to our next guest, the city of Houston may have a solution. Nicholas Kristof is an opinion columnist for The New York Times, and for his latest piece, he visited Houston and Dallas to compare how both are addressing the issue, as he tells Hari Srinivasan. Christian, thanks. Nick Kristof, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Nick, your recent reporting for The New York Times uh, an op-ed contribution, looked at homelessness. And what was interesting to me is most of the news around homelessness today is pretty hopeless. And I want to first start off with asking you why you chose to focus on these two cities in Texas. Well, uh, I'm on the West Coast and, you know, frankly, up and down the West Coast in the cities, it really does feel pretty despairing. And I'd been told that Dallas and Houston were a great microcosm of what works and what doesn't work, that you know, Dallas and Houston are both blue cities. Uh, they both cared about homelessness. They both had homelessness problems and both tried to address it quite seriously. And uh, the upshot was that in Dallas, the problem got worse. And in Houston, they managed to reduce homelessness by more than 60 percent since 2011. And so I thought, look, most of the country is Dallas, but Houston has figured out how to make progress. We should learn from it. So I went to the two cities and and tried to learn something. Yeah, let's t let's look at the positive first. Um, what was or what is Houston doing right to drop their homeless num numbers so significantly? So, you know, there's no secret sauce, and Houston still has a homelessness problem. Just uh, they, they've done better than others, but uh, it's not perfect. But you know, I think they did a few things uh, really well. They had uh, really strong political leadership. They have a strong mayor system, and that that mayor used the uh, those powers to maybe above all to herd the nonprofits uh, who were in this area to herd them so they're all pulling in the same direction so that they coordinate their efforts. You know, in a lot of cities, uh, you know, different different outreach organizations will reach one homeless person, you know, five times and won't reach another at all. Uh, they, in, in Houston, they were very, very good about coordinating uh, and about execution. Um, they also um, did, I think, a uh, the, the backdrop is that in Houston, it's cheap and easy to build housing. And so, um, you know, in Houston, you can build a one bedroom apartment uh, for say two hundred thousand dollars, you know. Meanwhile, in San Francisco, it is cost uh, in some cases more than a million dollars to provide a single housing unit for people who are homeless. Um, and I guess finally, that you know, in Houston, they really focused not just on general help for people who were on the streets, like giving out jackets or counseling, but above all, just relentlessly on moving people into housing and then on keeping them there. You know, we hear in uh, on the Times, you walking around, watching someone that's on the streets get interviewed. What was what worked in that compared to how different nonprofits are trying to do intake in different cities? So in a lot of uh, cities, that intake process is uh, not coordinated. Um, in contrast, in Houston, there is a central database. So all the uh, nonprofits, there are about 100 nonprofits in Houston that work with people who are homeless. Um, so they all work on a central database. A person is entered into the system. Everybody else knows that they are in there, what they have, what they need. And then this, this intake process was just so much focused on the barriers to housing. So, for example, in this case, um, one of the basic barriers was this uh, gentleman, uh, Joe Cavazos. He did not have an ID. And, you know, that is just so common among people. They don't have their birth certificate. They don't have a driver's license. They can't prove who they are. And so even if he had been able to apply for a government ID, there would have been no way to get it to him. Uh, there would have been no way to to tell him that, you know, where to pick it up. And so Houston has um, set up a really good system to provide those government idea, uh, IDs so that people can be put on a on a track to housing. And so that's, you know, that's kind of where it starts. And let's juxtapose what's happening in Houston from uh, a city just a few hours drive away in Dallas. What is 
Dallas emblematic of in how that city deals with homelessness compared to so many other cities in America? So in Dallas, the traditional efforts were, um, you know, very uncoordinated. They were very, very well-meaning and they did some things, you know, really well, but it wasn't coordinated. It's a weaker mayor system. It's uh, execution just did not work. Um, and I guess really what struck me uh, was that while Dallas was full of compassion and full of good intentions, you know, good intentions are not enough. And it is about evidence-based policy. It's about execution. In the early 2000s, there, one city after another all around the country introduced 10-year plans to eliminate homelessness. And looking back, those 10-year plans to eliminate homelessness were uh, really just symbolic. They really didn't achieve anything. And I think around the country and in Dallas, there were a lot of those, um, you know, announcements, uh, a lot of talk about how housing is a human right, but none of that actually got people into housing. Uh, there is a little bit of a postscript. Um, the, the folks in Dallas, when I was asking about this, they were, you know, it was a kind of a, Strictly conversation to be to be the uh, the contrast to Houston, but a few years ago, Dallas really just got fed up with the homelessness. They saw Houston success, and they began to copy the Houston model. And so, as a result, now the last two years, Dallas has made real progress against homelessness using that Houston model. Now, Dallas is really excited that they've turned the corner. That numbers of people who were homeless in Dallas are going down, and so they're you know they're kind of excited that now they've got it right and are quite full of optimism. Houston, on the other hand, while it has been very successful, I think faces some real challenges. Houston has uh, done this on the cheap, which is impressive that they haven't spent the hundreds of millions of dollars that the West Coast cities have. But Houston has essentially used federal money, uh, typically COVID money, and that is now running out. And so the challenge will be, will, you know, Houston has developed a model that works, but will it be willing to fund the model with its own money rather than just federal money coming in? And that is unclear. Uh, I think there is some real anxiety among uh, Houston civic leaders about whether they can sustain the momentum when they're forced to rely on their own resources. So zoom out from these two cities for a little bit. How significant is the problem in the United States? So it's an, you know, it, it's an enormous problem. On any uh, given night, uh, about 580,000 people are uh, homeless. And, you know, that's on any one night, but the problem is much greater because people cycle in and out of, of, of homelessness. And, you know, if they, for a while they're on somebody's couch, then, you know, they they, they find a place and then they're in the car uh, and then they're in a shelter and then they get a place. Um, and it's, uh, we only tend to see the tip of the iceberg that is represented by people who are unsheltered and actually out on the street. There's a, a an enormous number of folks who are, um, and especially the kids, uh, including those who go to school, who are, you know, doubled up on couches and uh, neighbors' plays, who are in vehicles, uh, this kind of thing, and. Um, I especially worry about the impact on kids. Kids who are growing up in that situation. How can you concentrate in school when you know when you don't have a home? So, what are some of the primary reasons that people slip into homelessness? I mean, is it uh, you know medical debt? Is it a divorce? I mean, what, what kinds of reasons did you see when you were walking and talking with people who uh, are are adding homeless populations into Houston's database on a daily basis? So uh, a financial crisis of some kind is very often what tips people who are uh, vulnerable and fragile into homelessness. So uh, a health crisis, a medical crisis is very often a factor. And it's not just the bills, but it may mean that somebody no longer has the ability to work. Um, we have so many Americans around the country who are um, just living right on the edge, paycheck to paycheck. And, you know, the moment that paycheck doesn't come in, uh, they're in a crisis. 
there are also an enormous number of uh, folks who um, might be able to afford, you know, seven hundred dollars a month, eight hundred dollars a month uh, for rent, but they have bad credit or they have an eviction history. And if you have an eviction history in the last seven years, it is very, very difficult to get anybody to rent to you. you know, likewise, if you have a felony conviction, very, very difficult. And um, so all those are factors. But again, I think there is a risk of focusing just on the population that is uh, that is homeless and not on the structural factor of not enough housing. The metaphor that is often used is musical chairs. And if you have a game of musical chairs and there is one seat too few, there is going to be somebody who lacks a chair. And in the same way, if we don't have enough housing, there are going to be some people who, you know, who are out of housing. And in that scramble, it's going to be people who are least competent, uh, least skilled, uh, more disabled. And, you know, very often that is people with addictions, with alcoholism, uh, with uh, with various other issues. Um, but the fundamental problem is not enough chairs or not enough housing. So I understand that it's less expensive to build a new structure in Houston. But how much does, for example, zoning factor into where people can get shelter? Zoning and uh more broadly kind of NIMBY issues, not in my backyard issues, are I think a huge factor. And, you know, look, I'm I'm a liberal and I believe in zoning and I've always believed in it. And when I was driving into Houston uh, for this story, I saw this endless urban sprawl and I'm feeling kind of smug that, you know, back in Oregon, we don't have that kind of sprawl. But I mean, the uncomfortable truth is that that lack of zoning uh, also makes it cheap uh, and quick to build. And it's one reason why the cost of housing is a lot cheaper in Houston than it is in uh, in Oregon or in California. And so there are real trade-offs there that I think my world of liberals has to wrestle with that, you know, we we try to preserve neighborhood character. We try to preserve wild spaces and those are important goals. But the upshot of that uh, and also is effectively that we often give a veto to communities over building new housing, and that raises housing costs. And when you have higher housing costs, then you end up with people who are often uh, homeless. We got rid of SRO housing uh, around the country beginning in the 1960s, and that was intended as a way of improving neighborhoods. And in fact, one of the upshots was that we ended up with more people sleeping on sidewalks. When you said SROs, you mean single room occupancies, right? Yeah, Harry. I mean, the paradox is that historically we had solutions to homelessness in the form of cheap housing. So we had single, single residency occupancy uh, hotels and buildings that were a little like a dorm. It'd be a you know a small room to sleep in, and then a shared bathroom, uh, maybe some kind of shared kitchen facility, uh, and. Uh, the only real advantage of those was that they were cheap and they weren't great housing, but they were so much better than sleeping on the street. And then because they had a reputation for being seedy, uh, they, they were kind of zoned out of existence in city after city around the country. And, you know, we thought that we were improving neighborhoods. The upshot when people didn't have access to those was that they often ended up on the street. And um, I think we have to provide something like those old traditional boarding houses, uh, rooming houses, the way we once did. So when you think about that not in my backyard tendency and so many places around the country who want to shelter people, what can they learn from Houston or other places? So I think that part of it indeed has to be to ease the 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 housing uh, shortage and make it easier to uh, build. Um, and there are a number of ways to do that. You know, one is simply that we there are about thirty five million unused bedrooms in America, and it used to be common in the United States to have you know a basement flat that one would rent out or occasionally to take in a border uh there are a lot of four and five bedroom uh homes 
reflecting a, a housing stock that uh, served a much larger uh, nuclear family structure um, that are you know hugely underused. Those could be turned into rooming houses, which used to be very common and now have pretty much vanished. Um, and I think that also, you know, I'd love to see cities like Portland or San Francisco learn from Houston and have this kind of coordinated approach of nonprofits to uh, to support, uh, to, to reach people. You know, in Portland, there actually was a survey of people who were homeless and uh, two thirds had not been ever contacted by a outreach worker in ways that would lead to housing. And of the one third who had been contacted, um, most had there never been any follow up. Um, you know, one thing that Houston has done with that outreach also is find uh, is to ask people, you know, is there any relative who might be able to help you to be in touch with you to take you in to provide support if you're trying to to get off of drugs uh, or is there any source of income are you a veteran who is there any disability possibility is there any income stream you might be eligible for and all these things you know at the margin they help so what's the most effective policy that research has found is doing the most to stop homelessness i mean is it as simple as just saying housing or sheltering people or is there a difference or distinction between say homeless shelters and giving somebody an apartment a set of keys so that medical services or other social services can show up at a centralized location i mean what's working so i i do think that fundamentally uh, providing more housing more cheap housing uh is the single biggest factor uh there's quite a bit of research that underscores that and for example west virginia has an enormous problem with addiction but west virginia does not have a substantial homelessness problem because in west virginia you can you know rent a, a small apartment for five or six hundred dollars a month you know, try doing that in california uh and so i do think that providing more housing lowering the costs uh, thus uh, making it more accessible uh, helps a great deal i think we have to tackle this issue of people with uh, bad credit or with eviction histories one of the you know problems is that if you uh if you if you're facing a one thousand dollar rent you don't just have to pay one thousand dollars you have to also pay you know a month security deposit for example you have to pay various fees and so there are a lot of folks who might be able to pay that monthly rent but can't afford all these fees to get them off the street um and then you know outreach work good outreach just makes such a difference uh in trying to help people make that move uh, into housing. Nick Kristoff of the New York Times, thanks so much for joining us. Good to be with you, Harry.